What's up, everybody? Sam Payne here, and welcome to the My Coder Podcast. Now, before we go anywhere, I have a question for you. Do you love Lego? Bit of a strange question to ask, so I can appreciate that on a, a business podcast, but today's guest is Brett Miller, and Brett is the founder of Brick. Now, Brick is an incredible company, guys. Brett has got something really special there, because what they offer are customized Lego MacBook Air and MacBook Pro cases. Now, this is such a simple but genius, just simply genius concept because all you do is you get a plain colored case with um, which has got the Lego pattern on it. And then you order your bricks and you can either order them a customized image, which is already done, or you build out your own images with flat Lego bricks on the back of your case. And you can make really cool custom designs that just, they just stand out and they make, they're just so different from anything I've seen before. Now, I love Lego. I mean, I absolutely loved Lego as a child. And my son, he's nearly one years old now. Well, he's, he's one in three weeks from the time this recording, I believe. But, I cannot wait for the day he's old enough to play with Lego properly because, I, I mean, I'll take you back to my childhood. It was I loved big Lego castles and planes, and I think I got a big like Star Wars Enterprise ship and stuff, and it was just the best present. And I So having this Lego product really brought back some awesome memories for me, and it's just fun. It's just such a cool product. Other things that Brett's doing with Brick is bringing out tiles, okay? So the tiles that stick to your wall. Um, my wife pointed out, well, will that leave a mark? No, I asked Brett this, they don't leave marks on walls, okay, obviously I didn't think of that, but on these bricks, guys, same concept, you can build your own wall uh, wall art, wall patterns, you can bring the Lego out from the tiles, so you can have little shelves and key hooks and oh, loads of really cool stuff, so if you're interested in Lego, if you're interested in how to make a manufacture, sell, ship physical products. If you're interested in how to start a successful Kickstarter campaign, if you're interested in how to market a physical product and con- and have consistent sales over time, if you're interested in the planning and what went into bringing this physical product to life, if you're interested in how Brett prototypes his product, the lessons he's learned, and I mean, there's a really quite, quite a funny story in there, guys. I won't go into it now, but it's in there about a lesson Brett learned the hard way on why you should really go through the prototype process thoroughly and how you can do that. And and in not such a time consuming way either. So this is a great interview, guys. It's got something for everyone, especially if you're looking to launch a physical product and all the challenges that come with that. And also, guys, anyone that's interested in launching a physical product through a Kickstarter campaign or a crowdfunding campaign of any type. So pin your ears back, get your notepads out. Enjoy this one, guys. This is the My Coder Podcast with Brett Miller from Brick. What's up, everybody? Sam Payne here, and welcome to the My Coder Podcast. Now, today's guest is Brett Miller from Brick. Brett, how are we doing today? I'm doing great, Sam. It's great to be here. Yeah, well, thank you for coming on. Um, I mean, genuinely, I think you've got one of the coolest products I've seen for such a long time. So I'm actually really excited to see how you managed to do this. And I'm sure the listeners are going to get a lot from this too. So before we actually go into this, though, could you just um, give us a little bit more of a backstory on you, what you do and where you come from and just um, how you're running things with Brick at the minute? Uh, Absolutely. Um, So I live in Menlo Park, California, and I've been out in California for about five years, bouncing around the Bay Area. Um, We had a few tech startups prior to this. Um, Some we sold, and then we went to go work for larger tech companies. Um, And when I say we, I mean my other co-founder, David Drips, who uh, who helped create all the brick products as well. And after this last one, we launched a Kickstarter campaign um, while I was actually at the last startup, and we found out um, that it was going to get you know too large to be able to do both at the same time. Um, so about six or seven months ago, I left that to focus on Brick full time, and it's been um, an incredible journey. And it's every day just waking up and getting to work on the thing you love to work on is incredibly fulfilling. Yeah, that is awesome, man. And 
you're obviously killing it with, with Brick because, and why wouldn't you as well? I mean, it's such an awesome product. So, and you mentioned there you've had other tech startups as well. So, is entrepreneurship something that's always been in your blood? Um, yes. So ever since I was a little kid, I was trying to find new ways to kind of innovate and, and make money. I remember uh, anything from like a carnival to a little store to museums in my parents' basement. Um, occasionally, I would have uh, my friends come over and their and their parents were like, my mom said I can't hang out with you today because um, I don't want to lose any money. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> brilliant. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's always kind of been, I guess, in my blood. My uh, my dad is an entrepreneur and was sort of raised that way. So it's exciting. I mean, I think part of it has to do with a little bit of a control, um, kind of mm-hmm. having control of your own fate, so to speak, and not getting caught up in um, bureaucracy or, or corporate politics. Mm. No, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, so you say you've always been interested in this from a young age. Did you ever go down the, the traditional get a job route, discover you hate it, or did you just start throwing yourself into your own project from the start? Um, yeah, I've, I've worked for other companies in the past, and I've actually really enjoyed those jobs. But mm. what, what I find is after about... 18 months or so, they start to get really boring. And even if you're, you know, getting promoted, getting raises, um, that seems to be kind of my, my bottleneck where I say, I've got to branch off and and do my own thing. And, um, after we sold our last one, our last tech startup, and I went to go work for another company, the primary reason for that, instead of just starting another one, was we didn't have another idea at the time that we were really, really passionate about. Mm-hmm. And for you know all the other entrepreneurs listening to this um, podcast, you know that it takes an incredible amount of dedication and passion to get an off- idea off the ground. So mm-hmm. if, you're, if you're not there, you're just going to burn yourself out and you're going to end up going to, to find another job anyway. So... Mm-hmm. Having an idea you're super passionate about is is a big part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you mentioned there um, your business partner again, David. Is is he's he always been someone that you've naturally just been partnering with from the start? I mean, because a lot of guys they try to go out the down the solopreneur route, and it, how have you found it's benefited you being partnered with David through your tech startups and then moving into Brick? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. We have very complementary skill sets. Um, we've partnered on several startups in the past and we work really, really well together. So it's, it's helpful. I, I remember Howard Schultz, um, has this book. I think it's like pour your heart into it. It's a book about founding Starbucks. And there's this quote in the book that he says, um, I'm paraphrasing here, but something like success is um, empty if you finish alone, if you get to the finish line alone. And and having someone there to kind of help keep you motivated that wants to talk about your business 24-7 with you so you're not burning out your family and friends with always talking about it, <laughs> yeah. um, it's also really helpful. Yeah. I mean, I've been there boring my wife to tears many <laughs> times. And she's like, Sam, please just shut up. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, that happens. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so finding someone that shares that passion and energy and you just kind of build off each other, that that really helps. I mean, I can definitely relate to this because when I first started out, I mean, we were just discussing before we come on, come on air is, I, when I left the military, I wanted to set up a gym and originally I actually set up a CrossFit gym, um, which I've still got, but I set it up by myself. And for the first 18 months, I was a one man band. I'd done everything myself. And as much as I loved CrossFit, and I think that was part of the main reason why it really worked, because I, I had that passion to just to keep grinding out through those hard times. But looking back, it was hell. It was absolutely awful trying to do everything by myself. And it wasn't the hard work, actually. It was actually having to question myself all the time and not having that other person to, to conform with and ask their opinion on anything. And it was only when I bought business, my business partner, Mike, in that things really started to take off. And, and now we've got a whole team in there working for us. And I'm enjoying it so much more than I ever have. It's so much more successful than it is. So I can completely relate to actually how much easier it is to having someone with you and a, and a team with you in, in whatever you're doing. Um, and I mean... 
like I said at the start, I mean, Brick is, is literally one of the coolest things I've seen for such a long time. And what made you think of making Lego MacBook cases? Uh, yeah, so this was about two Christmases ago. Um, David and a friend of his were had just gotten done doing a little, you know, Lego brick design, and then they were working on their MacBooks. And I remember walking by them um, on the couch and noticing that that design would actually fit really nicely on the back of the MacBook, and then they could kind of take it with with them, and I wouldn't be the only one that you know saw it there. <laughs> And so I hopped online real quick just to see if anyone had made a brick compatible MacBook case and no one had done anything um, for MacBooks or any laptops, actually. Um, so we built a prototype just using a laser cutter and like a base plate. And um, I took it home for Christmas and I was getting comments like crazy. I would take it through airport security and they'd be like, where did you get that? I'd go to a coffee shop and kids would just stop and stare while their parents <laughs> got coffee. And then they, <laughs> parents would ask me where I got it. And I'm not, I'm not like a high fashion guy, so I don't get compliments on clothing very often. <laughs> but, I <can> yeah. <laughs> but I can honestly say that I've never owned a single product that I've gotten so many positive compliments on um, as I have, you know, the brick book. And so when I got back from Christmas, we're just like, we have to put this on Kickstarter. And because there's obviously at least anecdotal evidence of demand. Yeah. And, and then that's what we did. Yeah. And I'm, I, I personally, I love Lego and I love Max. So for me, this is literally the perfect product. And have you found that I mean, it's interesting because you've got multiple products as well, haven't you, which we'll, we'll come on to a bit later on. But have you found that, that adults are getting more excited about the Lego than kids are? Yeah, it's really, really funny. So there's these comments and we read all of our comments. We send out surveys. We try to listen to our customers very, very ca carefully. And adults will joke all the time. They'll, they'll say, oh, I, we need to buy this for you know our daughter or our son. <laughs> But we're really just going to play with it ourselves. Yeah. Uh, it has this like nostalgia to it, where it's a it's not just a, a product that they can you know use, but it's something that they can kind of like justify as oh we're really buying this for our kid, but it's really for us. Yeah, and I mean I've, I've been checking out your site, and I'm just looking at it now, and you can do some really cool things with this, like hang your car keys off the back of it, and and, and make little shelves for things, and I think that's awesome. So when you was going through this process and people complimenting you and, and asking where you got this from. I mean, was this the sort of validation process for you or did you go further with validating this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> as we learned in the past, what people say they'll buy and what they'll actually buy, there's often a pretty big discrepancy there. Yep. Um, <laughs> so, it, it, you know, in the words of Jerry Maguire, show me, show me the money. Um, yeah. That's where you really, really get the validation. And, Luckily, we have a lot of tools for that now. You know, you've got Kickstarter, you've got Indiegogo, you've got probably a dozen other crowdsourcing platforms all over the world that you can use um, to really test and validate if people are, are going to spend money. Yeah. Um, so we put it on Kickstarter. This is BrickBook. This was the MacBook case, our original product. And uh, we were trying to raise $30,000. And the reason we were trying to raise $30,000 was we thought that's what the tooling would cost, which is sort of the steel molds that we needed to kind of create these plastic. Mm. Um, so instead of $30,000, um, we ended up raising around $92,000 in the 30 wow. days. And that was our real validation that, you know, this, this has the potential to to be a real company and to, to be a business. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and congratulations, by the way, on that, because that is an amazing feat. And it, it must have been incredible, that feeling, actually, knowing, I mean, how was that for you guys, seeing all this cash start pouring in and, and almost tripling your goal? Well, definitely it, tripling your goal, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. Um, we ended up getting featured on around 100 different publishers, um, Websites and we were on the homepage of Wired, which was really really cool because you know I'd been a Wired subscriber since I was a little kid, and being you know being featured on their site was really really fulfilling. 
Um, after the campaign finished, we were contacted by Vanity Fair, and we were actually featured as one of the ultimate gifts of 2015. Mm. Um, and then a few months ago, we were contacted by Oprah Magazine, and we were featured in Oprah's O List, which was also very cool. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. And actually, that was that was one of my, my questions to you because I mean, a lot of people will be listening to this going, "Do you know what? I would love." for a launch of my product to go this well. I mean, how did you guys go about getting featured in these magazines? What was that process like? Were these guys coming to you or you reaching out to them? How, how did this all come about? So the magazines, they reached out to us. Um, the original press coverage, though, was just researching. Um, so, so trying to identify who's your target audience. Um, mm-hmm. For us, we knew it would be... Um, people who liked Macs, right? People who were into technology and Lego and, of course, sites like Gizmodo and Wired um, and, you know, CNET technology, Yahoo technology are all sites that kind of fit that demographic. Mm -hmm. Um, So next, it was just about going and searching articles on that site that were somewhat related to the product that we were building. So anything around building bricks, anything around Apple product reviews, finding those journalists, and then just doing some quick Google searches to find their contact information and then reaching out to them. And so that was, um, just that method got us on Gizmodo and Wired um, and a few other major publishers. And then from there, it was just kind of like a domino effect because then all the longer tail publishers will pick you up too once they see it. Yeah, and that's great advice as well. And I think do you know what's so great about that advice, actually, is, is when you break that down, it seems so simple. And I think, do you think people seem to skip past the obvious answer sometimes and just look in the most obvious places to, to come up with this like, amazing marketing campaign? I think that it's um, overwhelming. I mean, even, even for me, when you launch that and, and you don't get initial traction right away, I mean, it took us three or four days before we really started to ramp up, um, which, is a sh- which is a short amount of time. I'm not saying if you don't get there in three or four days, you should give up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not not at all. Done. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we got pretty lucky with, with getting there that quickly. But, it, but it's daunting. You have all these publishers, you have bloggers, you have social media, you have like podcasts, and you're just like, where do I start? Where do I start? And you just end up bouncing around like a ping pong ball. I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs, I know, you know myself, uh, focus is sometimes difficult. And mm-hmm. what really, really helps is breaking everything down into lists and saying, okay, um, we're going to target the bloggers. We're going to target social media. These are the exact action items we're going to do. Here's the schedule in which we're going to do them and then just check them off one at a time. Um, because if you don't get it down on paper, um, it just bounces around in your head. And then you're sort of like paralyzed by trying to analyze which, which thing you should do first. Mm. Yeah, and no, that's great advice. That really is. And I'd actually like to go back to the start of this, though. I mean, what initially um, made you guys go down the Kickstarter route? What was it about Kickstarter that made you think this is definitely the platform to launch this? Um, we we were the most familiar with Kickstarter. We would both backed products on Kickstarter before. Um, I really liked their brand. And I can say now after doing two two campaigns um, on Kickstarter that we're going to, they're going to be our first choice um, going forward every time. On BrickBook, Kickstarter, um, they break down where your pledges come from. And they actually provided 30 to 40% of our pledges from Kickstarter, uh, which means the rest of it came from, you know, press and social media and all that stuff. But Kickstarter referring people to our project accounted for 30 to 40% of our pledges. And on Brick Tile, which is the one that ended a few weeks ago, um, we actually ended up raising 182000 on that campaign, and Kickstarter was even a larger percentage. Wow. So uh, they're, they're worth their weight in gold. I mean, they charge around 5%, I believe, and then you have the credit card transaction fees on top of that. But, you know, you do some simple math there, and, and you realize, wow, um, Mm, trying to yeah. yeah exactly trying to do this on your own like e-commerce site or something like that and doing pre-orders there um isn't nearly as powerful as as doing it through a crowdfunding platform particularly kickstarter mm. is the one we like yeah i mean if you think about it if you broke down the costs of 
um, the 5% the Kickstarter take, plus the fees you just talked about, you would pay way more than that in advertising if you went down a traditional advertising route to launch a product, right? I mean... Oh. Definitely, definitely. And there's this mentality that we found too when people are backing products on on Kickstarter that they they feel like they're contributing, right? It's not the same as doing like a pre-order on Amazon. They're part of the process. And one of the things that we didn't do as good of a job as we could have on the original Kickstarter campaign was making sure that we're constantly updating our backers with what's happening in the process. And with Tile, we learned this time that we're doing video updates. Anytime we have something new to share, um, we post an update. And it's actually really, really fun. And you have the opportunity now to build a lifelong customer, right? They're with you from the beginning and it's not as transactional. They helped you bring this product to market Mm. and now you get to, you get to share your story with them and build a real relationship, which I also think is unique to crowdfunding platforms as opposed to just doing a standard e-commerce. No, I I think that's a great point. It's real, it's real like grassroots, grassroots stuff, isn't it? It's being part of something from the ground up. And I think, I think you're right. There's definitely something there where people are happy to back because they just want to be part of something especially if they believe in the product um and i mean it, you you clearly put a lot of effort into your campaigns i mean i i love the video you've done by the way on the tile one i thought it was a great video and obviously you've a lot went into putting that campaign out and so what is the process you guys go through for everyone out there that's thinking of putting a, a kickstarter campaign together how much time do you take in the preparation phase? How much time does it take you to execute the videos, for example, and actually put everything together prior to even thinking of launching it? Yeah, that video um, that video took a, a long time. Uh, it's a stop frame animation. We have, I think, eight different sets. And we wanted to do something that tapped into nostalgia and emotion a little bit more than, you know, like a matter of fact, here's the process that we're going through. Um, I think trying to kind of find a balance there is really important. Mm -hmm. So letting them know what the money is for and letting them know how they're helping you is, is great, but also making them feel inspired, making them feel creative, showing them how this product is going to improve their lives is really, really important and not making it too long. So our first Kickstarter video was only 30 seconds and our second Kickstarter video was only a minute. And sometimes when you go and you watch these other ones that are five, 10 minutes long, um, you get, you know, you kind of get bored and and tune out. Um, Our videos are full, like the brick tile one, if we look at the analytics, over 50% of the people who started that video watched it all the way through. And if you do any sort of video advertising, you'll realize that that's actually a very, very high number. Yeah, no, it is. That's That's a brilliant, brilliant stat. Um, but yeah, so I'd say the video, um, watch other videos that have done really well, other campaigns, kind of try to model it after that. If you have a similar product to something that's already been out there and have all of those things in place and set up all of the support and software and know how you're going to handle that prior to your campaign too, because if you do get traction, um, it's, it's a lot more difficult to try to be, you know, to react to that instead of be proactive. Mm. Absolutely. And I mean, one thing when I've, I've, I've spoke to a couple of guys who have gone through this Kickstarter process and one thing they really struggled with was actually coming up with a pricing strategy. One for, because you can do different pledges, you give different gifts or, or levels of service for a different um, amount for your pledge. For the, and then also for actually coming up with how they, the, the goal you want to go for. Now, you've already touched on the goal you come up with and why you came to that. Could you go into now the pledges and how you decided what to price them at and, and, and what level of service or product they're going to get for that pledge? Uh, sure. So for the pledges, we, um, we first broke down what it would cost. Like what are our fixed costs going to be? What are we going to need to spend on the tooling? Um, what's shipping going to cost us? Um, how much are we going to have to spend in, you know, getting additional help for labor to put all the pledges together? Um, and then once we had that, that sort of hard number down, which by the way, we grossly underestimated how much yeah. it was going to cost us. And we ended up spending over the 92000 that we 
um, got from our pledges just to get the product out. Um, so I recommend to everyone maybe just double your numbers, double how long you think it's going to take to get the product out, and double your cost. Um, and then you have a little bit of a you know a little bit of a buffer there. But uh, don't get stuck in that situation. Luckily, we had a little bit saved up from you know previous startups and stuff that we could still deliver. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and now we're, you know, now we're in pretty good shape, but it took a couple months to kind of like recover that after we got the product out for the holidays. Yeah. Um, go ahead. No, no, sorry. No, go on, no, go on, please carry on. Yeah. So that, that's kind of like my advice for that. And then for the pledges, the reward levels, we, we just looked at what are the different use cases, um, for tile specifically, someone's either going to want to get a few tiles. You may, you know, maybe to put on their refrigerator or put next to their door so they could build a key holder and a sunglass holder. Um, or they're going to want to tile an entire room so they can do giant art installations and pixel art or do their kid's room. And we just selected, like smallest scenario and largest scenario and they just put a few intermediate levels in there um for people who might just want a, a couple yeah so i mean what you you're just really concentrating on the user experience at the end and not actually concentrating on what you'd like to charge for that i suppose yeah yeah once you have that hard number it's just div- a division issue there right yeah. and then you can you can say okay we think this one should have two tiles then six tiles then 20 tiles and then you just divide it obviously you provide a little bit of a discount for larger quantities um just to, to incentivize larger quantities but most of it it is um those decisions are made around the user experience and what we we predict that the users um or the customers will want uh, a lot of times we're we're right about that but they're vocal and they'll let you know very quickly if if you're not addressing a need of theirs, and then you can adjust. Um, the cool thing about Kickstarter is if you are wrong, you do have the ability to increase um, the amount of rewards for each pledge level and add additional pledge levels. Oh, that's, cool. that's good, actually. I, I didn't even realize that. That's, um, that's really cool, actually. And one thing I thought was really cool on your Kickstarter page, which I haven't really seen on many others, is you've actually got Kickstarter staff pick. What is that? I mean, I've never even seen that before. Um, yeah, so they used to do a staff pick during our original campaign. Um, now they have a new program called Products We Love. Um, so for the staff pick, I actually emailed um, Kickstarter support, and I was just like, hey, we're getting some traction on this project. Would you mind taking a look at it and considering it for staff pick? Um, and then I did the same thing for the products the products we love. Um, just reaching out to them, letting them know that you exist in the world, I think helps. Um, obviously you need to have a product that they actually, you know, like, and that probably has a little bit of a little bit of traction beforehand. Yeah. And that helped drive a lot of pledges for us too, just being in those categories. And it also provides some credibility. Um, we found that our second project was a lot easier to get off the ground because you have your entire set of, um, first pledges, of course. And all the customer email addresses since then, and you have the credibility that says, "Hey, listen, we backed these guys once. Um, they delivered a good product, and you know we have confidence that they're going to be able to deliver this one as well." Yeah, that, that's incredible, actually. That they they're emailing for for you on your behalf for, for your second launches of other products. That's that's just in, insane. And you've gone on about um, like how. The, the, the pros of using Kickstarter and how much it's benefited you. So for the guys out there that haven't used this before and are thinking of launching through Kickstarter, are there, is there anything that you've learned that you wish you knew from the start which would have saved you a lot of time when, when launching, through, um, launching your campaigns? Um, yeah. One of the things, uh, we originally were taking all the order changes through just like a Google spreadsheet. And... Once you get ready to ship these, you might seem like it has things organized, but you're going to need to print your shipping labels, um, you know, whether you're using USPS or, you know, DHL or FedEx or UPS and trying to export those when you have all these custom notes and these order changes um, with packing slips is a big pain. We use a software application now called 
ship station and we're able to export all of our orders and integrates with Shopify, which is who we use for e-commerce after the campaign is over. And you literally just um, put in all the weights of the products. It calculates everything for you and you push a button, the labels print out, the packing slips print out, and then you're just matching it. So I would recommend setting your fulfillment software up, um, right away. So when the campaign ends, you can just very, very quickly get that all integrated. Mm, that's great advice. And you said that's called ShipStation. Yeah, ShipStation. Perfect. So guys, I'll put that in the show notes below because um, <laughs> if anyone's going to know how this works well, it is Brett. So I'd probably advise going to that and checking that one out. And I mean, so okay, so you've, you've done your um, Kickstarter campaign. It's been a huge success. You've got your funds in place. So what next? I mean, how long after your campaign did you actually launch um, your first products? And, and what process did you have to go through to get to that point? Um, yeah, so our first campaign ended in April of last year. And we ended up shipping in November. Uh, we missed our deadline by a few months. As I said, I wish we would have doubled it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and... And then you know we've been we've been growing as a business ever since ever since then. Um, one of the things that we're doing we're, we plan on launching a new Kickstarter uh, product every year, and I, I can't talk about yet what we're doing next year. I'm really really excited about it. Yeah. But I can talk about our digital component because that's a very core part of our business. Um, what one of the things we found with with kids and adults is this screen time issue. Um, and you know what I'm talking about when you go to like a restaurant or a coffee shop or, and you see like a group of people sitting around each other and they're all just on their phones yep. <laughs> or playing games or texting. And, and there's an I- issue with engaging in person. Um, so what we really want to do is bridge this gap um, when it comes to play between the physical and the digital world. Um, our first attempt at that is called BrickBuild.com, B-R-I-K, Build.com. And it's it's a sort of a pixel art builder. So you can go on, you can say, I have you know a 15-inch MacBook Pro. It'll automatically you know draw a canvas for you that has the right amount of studs. And you can use the little builder to to draw any designs that you want and it'll calculate the bricks you need automatically and you can just order those right from the website. Uh, where this gets really, really interesting is the crowd um, crowdsourcing application. So after I create a design, um, I can submit that design to the community. And we have thousands of designs on our website right now that have been submitted by community members that now I can go through and select, you know, designs, do searches um, for like monkeys, if I'm into monkeys, and, you know, pull up a dozen different designs and I can either, you know, use those templates to build with the bricks I have at home, or if I'm missing a few, I can just, you know, order those right from the site. Uh, The way I like to describe it is if you, if you watch um, adults or children kind of collaborating and playing, um, if you have three, uh, three kids sitting around a table and they're all like, Oh, I have this. Oh, that'd be great. That's a great idea, but let's add this to it. Now imagine, taking that three and multiplying it by a million and having the ability to collaborate with millions of people and being able to save different versions and variations of designs, um, it gets really interesting. Mm, yeah, do you know, and I think this is an amazing feature. And it, it, it's, I love how you're doing this because you're not just, you're, this is, a huge part of your brand and what you're trying to represent. And it, it goes way beyond the product itself, doesn't it? I mean, it must be such a good point, which brings back um, business from, from the same people. Have you found that by adding in these features, you're getting so much more business? Yes. Um, it's definitely increased our, our brick sales and we have a lot of improvements. We're working on, you know, uh, brick build 2.0 right now hopefully it'll be released in the next few weeks um so you can kind of select tiles and do larger um larger installations but it gets it just it does a good job of mapping out our vision for the product and we're working with SendGrid, and SendGrid is who we use for our email 
Um, and they're, they're a great company, by the way. If you guys haven't selected uh, a company yet for email providers, use SendGrid. And what we'd like to do is track all of your purchases on our website and be able to send you value-added emails um, without requiring a purchase. So if you purchased, let's say, you know, four cases of bricks from our website and someone goes onto the design builder and builds a design, we know if you have the bricks at home that are compatible for this design. So we'll be able to send you an email that says, hey, listen, there's five new designs this week on the website that you already have the bricks at home to build. And again, it's about, it's about connecting with your customers and maintaining that relationship over time. And if you can find ways to, to make the product last a lot longer so they don't have to keep going and buying new sets all the time, I think it's going to build a really, really solid relationship and foundation. Mm. Okay, and that's, that is such a great idea as well. I think that's an amazing idea. And the brick build um, site itself is great. When I was doing the um, research for this interview, I actually found myself playing with the brick build design template for about 30 minutes to the point where my wife came in, she's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm just drawing <laughs> Lego <laughs> things all over and playing with backgrounds and everything. So I can see how having this, it, it's just so engaging. It makes you really like play with the products and get a feel for how this can work for you. I, I think it's just incredible. And so, I mean, we're in a world now where there's so many digital products on offer and the way technology is going, I think we're just going to see more and more digital products. But when it comes to physical products, it's a completely different ball game. So what, what challenges have you faced um, since starting this process when it comes to actually designing, manufacturing, and then you've touched on shipping already, but shipping these physical products? Yeah, it's a lot more challenging than software. Um, in software, you make a mistake and you patch it and you push a button and it updates and you're done. Yeah. <laughs> um, with hardware, um, ex- mistakes take a long time to correct and they're very, very expensive. Um, and I'll give you an example. We One of our backers um, for the brick, the brick book was Amazon, and they and they ordered them for their AWS conference in Las Vegas. Um, so that was really our big deadline. Um, the conference, I believe, was in October of last year, and we got our first shipment in, and we were so excited to to finally put these cases on and to build these Amazon logos. And we open the box, we're excited, we put it on the table, we get out our bricks, we go to stick the bricks to the to the cases and they just fall off. Um, and we didn't have our, our stud dimensions, right? Yeah. (laughs) So, so anyway, outside of just like panic of missing the deadline for this AWS conference, what we ended up doing was going out and getting a big tub of glue. And we spent the entire weekend gluing like 14,000 bricks to the back (laughs) of these cases. And, Oh. And, and and just including like a promo code for when the for when the final version comes out, you know, we'll replace this with with one that works. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then it ended up costing us something like twenty thousand dollars because we had to redo the molds for those cases. So it was a big bummer, and we very quickly learned um, the advantages of doing prototyping <laughs> and. <laughs> And like finding ways to, to test it before you do the tooling, because once the tooling's done, it's it's done. And yes. um, our manufacturer is is great, but they just assumed we knew about all this and we had done these things before, and um, that wasn't the case. So now we have much better methods for testing things. Um, we just purchased a three D printer, which has been awesome, by the way. I just yeah. wish I had one when I was a kid because you can you can just build all sorts of cool stuff on that. But it also allows us to do multiple prototypes in a single day um, so we can iron everything out before we send it over mm. to our manufacturers in China. Yeah, um, <laughs> that literally takes the saying, measure twice, cut once to another level, <laughs> doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> it does. Indeed. I bet you were cursing each other all week. <laughs> oh, man. 
Yeah, and the you know, and the no sleep from gluing all of those <laughs> on faces too. But, but we did deliver it, and they were very happy, and uh, we're still in contact with them today. And um, it was it was a yeah. battle story, right? Yeah, I bet you had no skin left on your fingers or anything after all the glue and the fume. I've got so many visions right now. Of what's going <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a rough weekend. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but once we finally got them, so I remember we were driving down to the warehouse, and we ha- we didn't have time for an additional prototype if we were going to hit our Christmas deadline and be out for the Vanity Fair article and all that stuff. Um, so. We're driving down to Los Angeles, which is where our warehouse was, and we're talking to our rep- representative in, in China, and he said, did you get the samples yet? Um, and granted, this isn't just a couple samples. This is thousands of units. I mean, this is the inventory to fill the orders. <laughs> and he's like, I just want to make sure that you, you know, we have the same definition of what fit means. And I just look at David as we're driving, and <laughs> it's like 2 a.m. I mean, the thing with this sort of business is you don't sleep. I probably work about 14 hours a day, and it doesn't feel like work because you love every – well, you love mostly every minute of it other than, you know, like gluing bricks occasionally. Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, we're driving down there, and then we, you know, we get some rest. We wake up the next morning, go to the warehouse, open up the boxes, and um, we go to put it on the back of the MacBook, and it – clicks on perfectly and then i take out you know a handful of bricks i'm getting ready to test them and david's just like i can't stay here for this so (laughs) he leaves he leaves the room and i go to put one on and it just fits perfectly and i put you know one on another stud and another stud another stud and they fit perfectly and i just start jumping up and down like uh, it's like tears of joy excitement (laughs) because this was the company if these didn't work we'd miss our deadlines we'd be completely out of cash and it'd be done. So it was a really, really big moment. Um, since then, we haven't had anything that was nearly that um, yeah. stressful. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you couldn't even play with Lego because it wouldn't have fit. <laughs> There'd have been yeah, nothing left yeah. at that point. <laughs> it would have been horrible. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things we try really, really hard, uh, we use really high quality plastics and um, the the fit and and that part of it is really important to us. So like if you look at our Amazon reviews, we get great reviews, and it's because so many companies have built, um, for lack of a better term, like Lego knockoff products, and didn't really pay attention to the fit. And even kids, you know, they know the difference um, between poor quality and good quality, and when things fit correctly and when they don't fit correctly, and so. Having that right was really, really important because if the fit wasn't good on the on the cases, none of our case customers would have purchased tiles, right, and so on and so forth. And you know that brings me on to um, what you just said previously. Brings me on to a nice point about the actual team you've got in place that run this because you're you're dealing with guys overseas in China. Um, this must come with a few um, issues or challenges, shall we say, when it comes to things like just communication, time differences. So, I mean, what team have you got in place to actually run Brick, and and how do you manage the time differences, the cultural differences, and everything else? Yeah, we keep the company really, really lean. Um, One of the things that, you know, we've learned just being out in the Bay Area is it's pretty common practice for a startup to show a little traction, go raise a bunch of money, hire a ton of people, and just burn through the cash quickly. Um, We didn't want to do that. In fact, outside of the Kickstarter campaigns, um, we haven't taken any additional funding. Um, And we do that intentionally, A, just to kind of keep the equity um, and the control in our hands. Um, But also, we just... uh, We want to make sure that we can weather any storms if they happen. And right now, we have the the energy and the passion to do a lot of the work ourselves. Um, we have one full time employee at the at the warehouse that kind of fulfills all the orders every day, does inventory, gets all the shipments from you know China and um, and our other sources, and then uh, we have a full time marketing support person in the Philippines, and they just kind of help um, maintain our social media, some of our customer support, some of our website stuff. Um, and then our, our representative in China at our factory there. And so we use a combination of Slack and 
uh, Skype to communicate. Um, typically, our calls with China are in the evening, and our conversations with the team in the Philippines and the warehouse are in the morning. And you just kind of got to be available twenty four seven. But luckily, you know, there's the tools out there make it so much easier to do that now. Mm, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, so uh, you've obviously after a lot of um, a lot of uh, getting things wrong, as we've just discussed. Um, <laughs> You've managed to now this process where you've got a great team in place, you've got a great product, which is just going out the door now. But what do you do in terms of marketing and advertising this? I mean, from the Kickstarter campaign, that obviously gave you a lot of traction from the start. But has there been anything else you've used from the start? And and has anything changed in your marketing campaign now you've become more established? Um. Yeah, we do a combination of Facebook advertising, um, our retargeting campaigns. If um, anyone out there is not familiar with retargeting, when you visit a website and then you go to another website and you see an ad for the site you were on previously, um, that's retargeting. It uses a cookie in your browser and um, it just kind of helps remind you that the product exists if you didn't if you didn't complete checkout or if you didn't purchase it. Um, That's where we get our lowest cost per acquisition is retargeting campaigns. Um, Facebook advertising has been very effective for us. Um, We still reach out to bloggers and press. We still get a lot of inbound um, from bloggers and press to feature the products. So that helps a lot too. And then we try to stay pretty active on Instagram and on Facebook and when we release Tile and we start to see more people getting creative with room designs and sort of like home improvement, then we're going to uh, focus really heavily on Pinterest and House and some of these other websites. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, one question I was, I was actually curious about this is, have you actually heard anything from Lego itself, the company, <laughs> um, since uh, launching this? Yeah. No, we, we try very hard to to kind of follow, um, just follow the standards for these bricks. Um, Lego's utility patents for the interlocking sort of brick method um, expired in the late 80s, which is why you see a lot of like Mega Blocks and Creo and some of these other products that are also compatible hit the market. Mm. Um, They still have, you know, I think thousands of patents. They have patents for their minifigures and stuff like that. So one thing that we're very... Um, careful about not just for Lego's sake, but but for making sure that we're transparent as a company and that our customers trust us is that we want people to know that we're not an official Lego product. Um, and you know we we state that anywhere the product's kind of listed in any marketplace. Um, the last thing we want is for people to to be expecting it to have Lego's logo all over it when they get their package because they're not going to get that. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, and, Brett, I mean, we're, we're sort of running towards the end of time now, and this has been a, a great interview. I mean, we've got, we've got tons, tons and tons from this one. But before we wrap things up, have you got any parting words of wisdom you'd like to share with the listeners before we uh, leave you today? Um, yeah, I would just say... I would just say, you know, make sure that you're picking a project that you're passionate about Don't give up too early. Um, Find someone, even if they're not in your business, to kind of emotionally help you weather the storms um, because there will be ups and there will be downs. Uh, But, yeah, do something that you love. I feel like like life is really, really short. And um, to kind of borrow a phrase from from Steve Jobs' speech that he did um, for the graduating class at, at Stanford, um, don't live your life um, building someone else's dreams. Mm. Do something yeah. that, that makes you happy. Yeah. And, and then the money doesn't matter so much. It really doesn't. Um, when you wake up every day working on something that you love, that's just a secondary thing. And, and I noticed, um, Sam, on your website that you had like the book, uh, like 40 – top entrepreneur books um, yeah. and I encourage your listeners if they haven't gone and checked out that list yet to go check it out because I think I've read over half of those things and and as an entrepreneur you want to sharpen the saw um, the same way you know you mentioned your gym earlier if you don't exercise your body's not going to stay in shape if you don't exercise your mind even if some of the things in this book in these books you've read before um, rereading them helps to exercise your mind and so I just uh I just encourage everyone to go check that out too and, and 
keep uh, keep motivated. Yeah. Well, thank you for the shout out anyway. I mean, and that book list actually, I've I've probably read about ten books since, and I've probably got a few more I can add to that. But uh, I agree with you. I mean, I I love reading. I get a part of my morning routine. Is I and my daily routine. I like to read for like an hour to an hour and a half a day throughout the day. I mean, it's it's something I'm I love doing and I'm passionate about. So I can completely agree with you. And I mean, if you do enjoy what you're doing and truly enjoy it, I mean, you said you work like fourteen hours a day. But before you know it, the day's done, right? You don't even know you mm-hmm. work 14 hours. I mean. Yeah, you don't. It's not like you're sitting at your desk waiting for five o'clock so you can go home. I mean, you, you wake up, you get into work, and then you're, you're constantly working throughout the day. Even if you go for a run or you hang out with friends for a while, um, when you get back, there's always stuff to do. So it's not an eight to five thing at all. It's, a, it's sort of a 24-hour-a-day thing, and then you just find time to do the things you love. Having said that, it still gives you the flexibility to travel. Um, so when I'm going to go visit family for holidays or something like that, I'll go for a week, and I'll just work from there. But then when there's events and things, you can just go do it, and that's really, really nice as well. Yeah. No, I agree. Completely agree. And I mean, Brett, um, that, he's always got to, all we've got time for today. Again, thank you for coming on. That was an incredible interview, and I know the guys... Uh, even me personally I got so much from that I mean you can't see but I was jotting like mad and I know the guys would have got a lot from that too so before we leave you today Brett where is the best place for people to find you online and how can they get in touch with you sure Um, you can go to brickbook.com b-r-i-k-b-o-o-k.com and uh, we can actually put together a promo code if you'd like to put it in the show notes that would get everyone a discount. Um, I can shoot you an email right after this f- with that information. Um, and if you'd like to contact me personally, uh, my email address is brett at joltteam.com, J-O-L-T-T-E-A-M.com. Brilliant. And thank you for the promo code as well. That, that's really generous of you guys. And um, I'm going to jump on that myself as well. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to get on there and order myself a... Uh, a case and I'm going to get on that design the um the the sorry the book design the brick build and I'm going to I'm going to design myself a case as well so thank you for that um Brett that's it thanks for coming on today incredible show we really appreciate your time and good luck with the launch of the new site and everything else that's coming up for you guys in the future thanks a lot Sam this was great Okay, guys, and there it is. Brett, thank you so much for coming on the show today and just delivering so much value, okay? As Brett discussed there, guys, in the interview, there is a promo code for that product, which you will see in the show notes below. So if you are interested in grabbing yourself one of those Mac cases, then jump on it, guys, okay? And just have some fun designing that case because they are brilliant. And also, if you are looking at setting up a physical product or selling a physical product, shall we say, then I would definitely listen to the advice that Brett gave there because he has learned the hard way the things that go wrong when it comes to especially going through a Kickstarter campaign and then transferring that over into an actual launch of the product, okay? There's so many working parts you have to keep your eye on. So if you are going to do that, guys, I'd recommend just keeping this um, podcast interview close by because Brett gave a lot of little golden nuggets there which can save you some time and money okay now if you are thinking of setting up your own product guys if you are thinking of setting up your own company or selling your own product should I say if you are thinking of launching a company even with digital products then we have the course for you okay I have teamed up with Greg Isaacs from High Performance One and we have created the High Performance One program now the struggles that entrepreneurs face when they go out by themselves starting from scratch is they generally haven't got the right mindset. What do I mean by the right mindset? Well, you need to actually be in a place of self-development, self-learning, and you need to be open to a lot of new ideas and possibilities that actually, one, you're never going to be right, and two, you need to be able to recognize opportunities or the right way to execute something when it comes along. Now, you need to be so tuned in, guys. You need to invest in yourself so much and build yourself personally, okay, as well as your company or business because as your business and company grows, you're going to grow with it, okay? And you need to be in a position where you are, like mentally, you need to be in a position where you are headstrong and you are ready to take on whatever challenges are going to come to you. And I've found that a lot of people struggle with this, especially in the early stages of their companies. And going from that early stage into when they start getting traction, that that point where they get a bit more attention is when it starts to ramp up again. They start to need that help. So we come together and we've devised this program which covers everything. We get you in the right place where you are going to learn, okay? We are how to 
better yourself as a person, okay? Then once we've laid a foundation where you are ready to go out and launch your company, we bring in the business side of thing, guys, things, guys. And that is where we take you through your business foundation and we literally help you launch your company and take it to success with you, okay? So this is a package that encompasses everything that involves personal personal growth and development and business growth and development okay which so we start with the personal we get you ready to go and then we launch you in your products your business because without the mindset guys without the right mindset you're never going to succeed okay no matter how much work you do so that's where we're going to work on you so if you are interested in that guys click on the high performance one link below in the show notes you will get so much value from that guys we have upcoming seminars coming all across the uk we have the first one, which is on this weekend, actually, Saturday, 29th of October. And we've got loads more dates coming up, which we'll be releasing soon. And that is it, guys. So thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure bringing you this episode, especially because I love Lego. OK, I love Macs. So it's a double pleasure for me. Um, but like I say, guys, if you do want to get your MacBook case, click the promo code below. If you want to check out High Performance One, click the link below. And I'll see you on the next episode of the MyCoder podcast. Mm-hmm.